piece. Uh, he went on the tour of sites associated with uh, the decisive uh, D-Day landings in World War II. He gave us a superb review of that trip in a, a visual presentation earlier this spring. Uh, one of the locations he visited before going to Normandy was an English country estate known as Bletchley Park. Uh, it is renowned as the center of, ally, of allied code breaking of the Nazi Enigma code and the genesis of the world's first digital electronic computer. Incidentally, if you want to learn more after heard his talk, you can watch the 2014 movie, The Imitation Game, uh, an overly dramatized but rather interesting portrayal of Alan Turing, a, uh, one of the brilliant crypto analysts at Bletchley Park. And I'm told there is also there is also a uh, PBS series simply called Bletchley Park. Um, now here's her to tell you what he found on that visit. Oh, uh, here's a prayer from first. Uh, first, we'll open with a prayer before Herb uh, entertains us with uh, some good World War II stories. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together as for fellowship on a nice fall Tuesday morning. We ask that you bless this presentation, help us to understand more about what happened during World War II and how it was brought to a close. We ask Heavenly Father that you be with all the members of our church who have lost family in the recent days. Bless them and bless this week for us. Amen. Well, thank you for having me back. Uh, as he said, I'm Herb Brownette. I've been a member of Westminster for about eight years and uh, I was a trustee for six. I, I attend the contemporary service and that combined with the fact that the trustees took up my available extracurricular church time. Uh, I don't know a lot of folks, but uh, anyway, I know some of you and one of my uh, commitments is to become involved in this group, and you've probably noticed I've, I've been in meetings when I can make uh, can make it. I am semi-retired. I started a little consulting practice uh, for some for uh, something to do and beer money, and it's been a lot more successful than I anticipate. So I stay pretty busy, <laughs> but but uh, but I enjoy every minute of it. So um, a little more background about me: I have a lifelong passion for American history. Uh, when I, the summer after I was in the uh, second grade, which was 1958, I'll date myself, uh, family took a trip to Williamsburg, Virginia, Washington, D.C. I got very interested in the American Revolution. I started reading every children's book there was. Uh, I had a fabulous eighth grade teacher, history teacher who we spent a lot of time on the Civil War and I got real interested in that. But anyway, history, American history is my lifelong passion. Uh, I have found uh, that that uh, when you visit historical sites, you get much more of an appreciation for what happened there. And I, I think anybody here who's been to Gettysburg, you know, can probably attest to that. Uh, so anyway, uh, in 2015, August 2015, uh, I took a bucket list trip. I was actually on New Year's Day that year. I was. Uh, watching uh, an episode of Band of Brothers for the umpteenth time with uh, one of my uh, significant other's grandsons. And, you know, it was New Year's Day and they're making commitments and all. I thought, you know, I keep saying I'm going to do this. By golly, I'm going to do it. And I actually went home that day and started uh, getting geared up for this uh, tour. Um, I'm also, I discovered, uh, well, first of all, how many folks here saw my uh, D-Day presentation this summer? All right. How about here, folks? Okay. Um, I, I am going to double back on that for, for two pictures because I realized that when I did that presentation, I missed what I think is one of the more interesting pictures I took. So uh, you may recall, and for those of you who weren't there, this is a picture of Suffolk House. It's the Officers Club at the Royal Marine Base at Portsmouth. It was Eisenhower's headquarters during D-Day. A couple of months before the invasion, he moved his staff out of London. Uh, first of all, for security reasons, 
Uh, there are too many bubs and uh, too, uh, too easy to let things slip. Uh, he wanted to be close to the assembly area and he wanted them to be very focused and quite frankly, there's not a whole lot to do here except work. So anyway, uh, that's what it was. And in there, uh, uh, this is a map, it's made out of wood. It's, uh, it covers a whole wall. The wall is about as wide as this space and twice as tall. And like I said, it's a wood map and it's got a magnetic material under it. And it had all these little wooden pieces for ships and units and everything that could, uh, that could be placed. And this was the, in effect, the mission control room during D-Day for Eisenhower and the Supreme Commanders. Uh, the interesting thing about this map is that they commissioned a toy company that made wooden toys to make this. Now it's it's about I would say uh, 200, 150, 200 miles wide. They had them make a map for the entire coastline of Europe, from central Norway all the way to Spain. One of these maps in sections, and the reason for that was. The best kept secret of World War II was where the invasion was. The Allies went to a lot of trouble to convince uh, the, the Germans that it would happen in the uh, Pas de Calais. You know, you may have heard of the ghost army with blow up tanks and airplanes and and uh, and uh, Patton running around like he's commanding something. Uh, they took an indigent dead body and dressed it up as an agent with secret orders and dumped it off the coast of Europe and no one ever washed ashore. And it, it worked. You know, the uh, Hitler was absolutely convinced, even on D-Day in the early afternoon, uh, when reports were coming on, hey, there's thousands of ships and airplanes here and hundreds of thousands of guys coming ashore. Uh, Hitler still, it, it was mid-afternoon before he released the Panzers, and it was, it was, which could only be released on his word. So it was very effective, kept secret. So, so anyway, they buy this map, and... Uh, a few days before the invasion, they, they tell the company to come out and bring all those sections. And they sent four guys and they went out to the truck and we said, OK, we want you to put that section on this wall. And they came in and they put it up. And when they got done, they said, you've done a great service for your country, but you can't go home. <laughs> because obviously it showed where the invasion was going to be. And so they, uh, they billeted these guys. Uh, they were pretty nice to them, gave them a lot of sausage and beer and all. And uh, as you may recall, the invasion was actually postponed. So it was about four days before they could uh, leave the base. Uh, they did notify their families. They said, look, they're doing a service for their country. They're not coming home tonight, but they're okay. Okay. So I, I just thought that was a great story. So, yeah. And I missed it last time. All right, let's get to the main topic today. We really did test this. This worked great when we. <laughs> Bring it back because it froze. I guess I talked too long. I usually stay damn computer as much when it's in the back. Oh, I can't go on the whole back on there because it's got all the total points. It's not share. Now we'll break that share.
we can blame the scientists at Wesley Park for this thing that it is. <laughs> Ah, all right. So on to the presentation. <clears throat> so part of this tour I went on. That works. That always works for other shows. Yeah, I'm trying to get back to the uh, screen for the. Do you guys see the presentation that are in Zoom? No. I didn't think so. Okay. I can see Gary Boyd, so I'm fine. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. So just real quick, the tour was we started in London. We went to the Churchill War Cabinet Rooms, which are kind of much of it. I've been there three times. Uh, the Royal Museum, the uh, Royal Military Museum, and then we went. Uh, we spent a day. We went from Bletchley to Suffolk House to, to Portsmouth, and then we crossed by ferry from Morton. But anyway, so our first stop that second day was at Bletchley Park, which I thought, well, this sounds interesting. I saw the movie, and it's kind of a cool house and all that. And I was totally blown away by what went on there and how much went on there. So, but the first thing I want to do is debunk the movie. Okay. <laughs> um, Alan Turin was a brilliant mathematician. He did lead the uh, decryption team and the team that uh, spent a lot of time speeding up decryption, okay, which is really the bigger part of the story. Um, he did have a tragic life. Uh, as the movie said at the end, he was a homosexual and a era when that was not only not accepted, but it was illegal. And uh, he had a lot of uh, legal issues after the war and he ended up sadly committing suicide. But anyway, uh, but, but here, here are some things about the movie that aren't accurate. First of all, he led a team of over 200 people, not four or five. I can't remember how many it was in his little inner circle in the movie, okay. Uh, Bletchley Park was commanded by Commander Alistair Dennison. And he did a fabulous job. He understood that brilliant people tended to be quirky. And as long as their quirks uh, didn't hurt anything, you should feed into them. You know, if, if you know, they believe that you know, they had to eat a certain something, make sure they get it. If they believe they had to do something to in the afternoon, make sure they did it or got to do it. Um, he, uh, he and Turin were very close. Uh, he was extremely supportive of the group their work and getting money to them. And so the whole thing in the movie where, you know, he's butting heads and resisting turning and all, that is total Hollywood BS, okay? Did not happen. Uh, in fact, his family, his son and grandchildren were so upset about the movie, they considered suing the producer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I guess, you know, portraying someone a certain way, uh, I guess isn't slanderous. But anyway, they, they backed off of it. Uh, the other thing uh, in the movie was um, they were decryptors. They had absolutely nothing to do with how the intelligence was used. And that did go on at Bletchley Park, but they had nothing to do with it. It was those huts over there and you know, we make this stuff work and they do something. Okay. So that whole thing in the movie where, oh, we've broken the code and this this convoy and my brother's on one of the ships and do we alert him and all? Once again, total Hollywood block. Okay. Uh, because the true story is they had a very supportive environment. They did a lot of detail, technical, uh, high intellect work that went pretty smoothly. And I guess that doesn't make a very interesting movie, does it? <laughs> you know, you, you got to have some tension and you got to have some conflict. And so Hollywood invented it. Okay, so that's that. I'll get off my soapbox. So, Bletchley Park Estate. Drum roll, please. Ah, 
I just touched the screen there, or right? Yes. So Leslie Park was built in the late 19th century by a wealthy stockbroker. It was purchased by the British government in, in 1938 for use as an intelligence center. Their intelligence center was in London. They could see the war clouds gathering. They realized uh, London was likely to be bombed, but also it's very hard to create a secure environment in a big city. And exactly the same reason Eisenhower moved his headquarters out. There can be spies there and, and things can slip and it's just very hard to control. So, you know, this was out in the beautiful English countryside. There are a lot of quaint little villages around. So uh, that made it easy to secure. You know, you could, you could patrol the property easily. Uh, you could billet the people that worked there, and there ended up hundreds and hundreds of people worked here. Uh, you could billet them in these little English villages where someone who doesn't belong would stick out like a sore thumb. And it was also uh, geographically uh, in a great location. It was about equal distance from London, Cambridge, and Oxford. And as you probably know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge are the two uh, educational, premier educational centers of, of uh, Great Britain. Um, they are not individual schools like Harvard or Yale. They're actually a collection of colleges in each one, but collectively, you know, that's, that's where it's at in British education. So that's where all these people came from. So here you, you know, so it was an ideal location. Uh, they also, and this is this is pretty uh, for the late '30s. This is pretty uh, uh, advanced. Um, they they recognized that these people were going to do important, hard, uh, challenging, intensive work, practically around the clock, and that creating an environment where you could go out and relax easily was important. So it has this wonderful park-like setting. Um, they have walking paths. They have little places where you can go out and eat your meal and all that. So uh, all very interesting. Uh, the government, uh, the house uh, itself um, is quite impressive. It's a wonderful Victorian mansion. A lot of details. Uh, I'm a construction guy, so, and, and I love uh, historical architecture, so I take a lot of this kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, this was the dining hall. Uh, so they actually had a dining room where you could come uh, eat meals, and the, uh, it had a beautiful skylight. Okay, that's the that's the entry hallway. You know, they don't build stuff like this anymore. <laughs> but you know, so. All right. They had a bar in the building. And by the way, the main building, it was an administrative building. Uh, the commander lived there, a couple of key staff people, but it was otherwise like public space, okay. Uh, they had a bar so people could drink after work safely uh, in a secure environment. And this, this, uh, this bar in this house was actually used as uh, the pub for the pub scenes in the movie The Unseen. This is Turin's office, little cubby, uh, where he could work. Um, and uh, yeah, he did he he did add uh, you know, a lot of intellectual horsepower to the exercise, but he was also an administrator. You know, when you've got anybody here who's been in management, when you got two hundred people, you know, and you're trying to get them all pulling all the words at the same time, and all that's that's a pretty challenging job. And resolving, you know, personality conflicts and all that kind of stuff. So he was quite a guy. This is actually his bicycle. Uh, he did not have a vehicle. So if you wanted to go to one of the little villages, uh, they did have a motor pool. Uh, they would cart people around, but he pedal around on his bike. This is the library. Uh, this was workspace during the day, but in the evening, people could come in there and relax and read and play a game of chess or something like that. So they were very accommodating uh, to the people that worked there. Uh, over time, they developed groups. They had a drama group, they had a chorus, uh, things for people to do uh, on their off hours. Uh, because what are you gonna do in a little village where you live in somebody's house, right? This is uh, Commander uh, Dennison's office. As you right at the front door, you can see what's going on and coming and going scenario. 
Now, like all country English, uh, country English estates, they had a lot of outbuildings. So uh, the building in the back is the garage, and they did they did maintain a motor fleet. Uh, you didn't drive there on your own. You didn't come and go on your own. You you, uh, you used uh, the uh, internal Uber service. So um, this uh, this building on the right. Push something that I shouldn't have. This was a cottage, and uh, before they built other buildings on the property, this is where um, uh, Turin's team got started and did their a lot of work. And kind of interesting maze of buildings. Now, the government built this series of wooden, mostly wooden structures, wooden and brick. Here's a couple of them. Uh, they called them huts. And this is where most of the work uh, was done for most of the war, was in these huts. <clears throat> Veritable Warren there. All right, let's get to code breaking. The Enigma Code, what was the Enigma Code? The Enigma Code was a code produced by this machine known as the Enigma Machine. It was uh, developed by a German company in 1922 for commercial, diplomatic, and military encoding of messages. It was widely available commercially. It's not some secret invention, okay? In those days, you could go down to Staples and buy an Enigma machine, okay? So, uh, the, the, however, the coding uh, was, uh, was quite extensive. And uh, I don't know if you folks can hear me, but I'm gonna step over the screen here. Let me just, I can't remember if the next picture is the same. Oh, no. Okay, go back. All right. Is it working? Yeah, just went off. All right. Yeah. So. So it starts with a three-wheel setting, which is right here. And on that, each wheel is a letter of the alphabet. So the operator, if, if you had a code and, and uh, you, know, you knew that uh, if you're a bank, you knew that today's code was uh, C, F, Z or something like that, you, you'd set the wheels accordingly. And you would type a letter here and it would light up the coded letter there and you would write it down. Now, I know when uh, when I was getting my uh, MBA, I had to study probability theory and gaming theory, and you know we learned about permutations. Well, um, when you have a combination of numbers or a combination of items, uh, the number of permutations, in other words, the number of answers you could get, is uh, is the number on of, of the number for each sequence to the power of the number of choices. So in this case, it's 26 to the third power. That comes out to 17,356 combinations. All right. Now, that's pretty strong to start with, okay? In addition, they had this plug board, and the plug board had um, 14, uh, you, could, you could plug in, um, up to, um, it, it had, I'm sorry, it had 14 letters on it. You could plug in up to seven chords. And when you plug the chord in, it transposed that letter. So if today's code say resulted in uh, R being C, you could plug into C and then plug into U and it would change it to U. So it created another set of variables, all right? 
So if you use all the plug board, which they seldom did, they, the, the Germans seldom used more than five, there were 153 trillion possible combinations. Wow. Okay. That's a big number. It is a big number. And in fact, yeah. Okay, I'm going. I, I, I'm going to make one political comment. As we see what's going on in Washington, most people don't realize how much a trillion is. <laughs> it's a thousand billion, which is a million billion. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'll get back on task. Um, so that's you know pretty simple. That's the way. Uh, that's the way uh, the machine worked. And so for the code breakers. Uh, the key was to, you know, if if you could figure out the three dial setting, you were pretty far along the way. You wouldn't have every letter, but you would have a lot of letters. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> oh, and then the German military change the settings daily. And each branch of the military had their own settings. So um, the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, uh, the, the uh, Weimarck, the Army, and the, uh, the Luftwaffe, the, the, the Air Force. They all, so, so in order to, you know, you had to decode, uh, if you really wanted to you know, get into everything, you had to do it every day. Now they started out focused on the German naval code because the U-boat threat, you know, really did almost bring uh, Britain to its knees early in the war, and they, you know, that was their first priority was was to break uh, the naval code. Uh, there was one weakness uh, in the machine which uh, helped with the math, which was no letter was ever itself, so you know M would never be M because that would add a whole other set of possibilities. Hmm. So, how do you break the code? Well, first of all, uh, the mathematics to break the code was actually solved by a, a group of Polish mathematicians in 1938. You know, with Germany and Russia on their borders, you know, they, in Germany gobbling up all his neighbors, uh, they felt very threatened, which appropriately was because, you know, the invasion of Poland actually launched the war. But anyway, uh, so they not only figured it out, but they got it to British intelligence before the Germans invaded. Hmm. So, so Turin and his team didn't actually figure out the math. Okay. Now, so um, each day you had these 17,356 17, calculations. I know there's a lot of numbers. Now. Forgive me, I'm going to count. But, uh, but anyway, um, a team of highly skilled mathematicians could manually figure it out if you had some starting letters. Uh, they could figure it out, you know, in some, like a number of days. All right. Well, intelligence has a very short shelf life. You know, and I can't remember if it's a week or a month or whatever, but if you had a hundred people with slide rules working real hard, you know, you could, you could figure it out. So the challenge wasn't how to break the code. The challenge was how to do it fast enough for it to matter. And so, Turing and his team uh, developed this machine. Uh, they called it a bomb machine, B-O-M-B-E, not like a bomb falling out of an airplane, but one of the Polish mathematicians was named Bomb. And uh, the logic, uh, you know, so if, if you're familiar with IT, you might be familiar with the term brute force attack, where you know, a computer just goes through all the alternatives until it finds the one that works. Well, that's this was susceptible to a brute force attack, which was to test all 17, if, if you had some starting numbers or some starting letters, test all you know, 17,356 of them until you found the one that worked, okay? 
that's called Boolean mathematics, that's a term, okay? Uh, which basically um, is, is the math of uh, true false values, one and zero binary. Is this starting to sound familiar? <laughs> okay. So no. what this machine did was um, they would have a crypt. I'll tell you how they got that in a minute. But of up to 12 letters, you could plug in in the back of the board and you could say, we know this letter becomes this letter. And each bank of three on here represented an Enigma machine setting and there's 36 of them. So it could do 36 ranges at a time and it would just go through and, and uh, keep working because they for each of those combinations, they knew what the code was. Okay, they knew that this would be the alphabet, okay? So it would go through each one. And when it finally found one that worked, it stopped. And the, and the dial set, each dial setting is letters that click, 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 click. And then bang, it would hit. Uh, these machines, uh, they, they ended up building, uh, let's see. I'll get to that in a minute, I'm sorry. Um, it could go through all 17,356 settings in 20 minutes. Um, the, uh, oops, let me again. <coughs> Quit touching stuff there, all right. So where did they get the crook from? You know, how did they figure out the letters? Well, um, and anybody of German descent take this as a compliment. We all know that Germans as a nationality are very organized, disciplined people. And certainly their military was. So what's that? <laughs> uh, and I and like I say I have to say that as a compliment. But in their military transmissions, they use certain phrases like um, message number. Hmm. Um, nothing to report. Uh, certain salutations for different officers were set. So when they when they picked up on a message and they said, "Okay, this, you know, we, we know that's what it's saying," they would then have those letters that are in that message. And most days they were able to get at least twelve messages. Now, the next thing they did was they had a check machine. So they had their own Enigma machine um, that was the same as the one the Germans used. I forgot the story how they got it. But anyway, um, they got that and they would do it and say, is, is, does this create a message that makes sense? And they didn't have all the letters, all right? And then they would play around with the plug board a little bit and just say, you know, kind of, randomly try, let's try this, try that, try that. And they could usually come up with one or two connections that worked. So they did that every day for all three branches of the service. Um, these machines, uh, they started using them in 1940. So right, right at the start of the war, how am I doing on time here? I don't Uh, these machines were operated uh, by uh, the women, uh, women who were uh, Wren's, W-R-N-S, Williams, um, Women's Royal Navy Service, their equivalent of our waves. They had no idea what these machines did. None. They were told, when we give you this, these letters, do this in the back. When it runs and it stops, write the letter down and bring it to us. And I'll talk about secrecy in a minute, uh, but they didn't know for many years that they had no idea what they were doing. And they said, yeah, yeah, we know this seems pretty boring, but trust us is important. So secrecy, obviously it was paramount to count these account to keep this secret. Because if the Germans ever found out, you know, they could change everything and you'd be you know, back to square one. 
So all staff, when they arrived, they signed a secrecy agreement, which was pretty severe. If you said anything to anybody about what you did here, whatever it was, you could go to prison for like 10 or 20 years or something. Um, and so, and a lot of the people there uh, did not know what they were doing. Um, Craig shared with me after my last presentation an article he picked up on, and I'm just going to uh, tell you about it real quick. Um, Uh, this lady's uh, name is Betty Webb. Uh, she was 18 year old in 1941. Uh, she grew up with a German au pair and uh, spoke fluent German. And uh, she uh, she joined the uh, women's branch of the army. She said she wanted to do more than bake sausage rolls for the war effort. Uh, when they found out she could speak German, uh, they sent her to Bletchley. Uh, and uh, she became a translator. And uh, they, uh, she was at the time of this article, which was 2020, she was 97. Um, she was never allowed to discuss, you know, what she did during the war because of this secrecy agreement. And it was kept secret for many, many years. And so uh, she found when the war was over, she had trouble getting a job because she couldn't tell people what she did during the war. And when you say, well, I can't tell you, you know, that's kind of like, eh, I don't know. Well, fortunately, uh, she applied for a job at a school where the headmaster had been at Bletchley and who, who um, knew who she was. And she walked into the door and said, you're hired. Okay. And she had a career there. So, but, you know, that's, that's the people side of this. You know, hundreds of people uh, affected by this. They, uh, they built over 200 of these bomb machines during the war. Some of them were built in the U.S. Uh, where the Britain shared the, uh, the design and the expertise to build them so, so the Americans could use them too. Um, they were, uh, they continued to use them. Uh, oh, after the war, they never told the Russians about these machines or this capability. So when the Russians captured a bunch of Enigma machines from uh, German military units, they started using it for their coding. <laughs> and so for the first few years uh, of the um, Cold War, we were able to read uh, the Germans, I mean, the uh, Russians and military messages, okay? Uh, in order to secure the technology and keep it a secret, all but one of the bomb machines was destroyed in the end of the war. I mean, after they quit using them, when the technology surpassed them, they destroyed the machines because they didn't want somebody to get a hold of them and figure out the logic. Okay. The one I showed you is actually a replica that um, some uh, uh, science majors uh, built. Uh, all right. So that's that's the that's the encryption part of the story, which is what the narrative's mostly been about. But oh, here's a these signs are everywhere. Oh yeah, who's left sink ships? You know that kind of thing. All right, we all know about the encryption. What I found interesting was this was also the intelligence data analysis center. All right, and this. HUT-3 um, is where uh, the data analysis took place. So you think about it, you get 1,100 messages, they average 1,100 messages a day. Uh, so they would be intercepted. Um, they had radio stations on the coast. They would intercept these messages. Uh, they would transcribe them because they're coded. They would give a piece of, they would give the hard copy to uh, motorcycle couriers who would jump on their motorcycles and take them to Bletchley as fast as they can. Now, I'm not a motorcycle guy, but that sounds like a fun job. You know, <laughs> that, you know your job every day is to get on this, you know, pow powerful motorcycle and ride as fast as you can through the English countryside. Okay. 
Um, like I said, I'm not a motorcycle. I'm, a, I'm more of a car guy. Uh, yeah. If it was a Jaguar, I think it's really cool. But anyway. So they intercept and then they decrypt. And I told you they had that, that decryption was done in HUD 6. All right. So now you got text messages, these messages in, in text, and they're not complete. You know, some of them have missing words, missing letters, because they couldn't figure them out. So translators had to kind of fill in the blanks. Not only had they speak fluent German, they had to also be familiar with military, German military terminology, and they would translate it. And then they would send it to HUT 3. Sorry. I'm having huts. As you can see, these huts were very functional. One long hall down the middle, offices on each side. And hut three was like an assembly line. So first thing that happened, the first uh, stop was to, was for a, a trained military intelligence officer to take the 1100 messages and decide what's important. You know, it's kind of like when you go through your mail every day and you throw all the ads away and you know, these people want to give you money, you know, all that, you know, and you get down to your bills. Okay. So the, the first triage was, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of administration in our army uh, or military in it. And a lot of it's pretty you know, mundane stuff, you know, police and wear cigarettes, you know, whatever. So uh, they would get down to stuff that looked like, you know, it was of operational interest. Then it would go here in this room where you had a representative from each of the, of the services, the, the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, you know, and the Army, and, and, a, and a couple of uh, trained intelligence officers. And they would go through the messages and say, a further triage, yes, this is important, and this is an Army matter, or this is important, and the Air Force needs to deal with it. And they would also decide who do we send this to. So if the, if, if the message said, uh, you know, uh, attack, uh, at, you know, at dawn, attack Hill 212 in Sector 6, you know, they would figure out, okay, that's uh, that's this uh, this general or, or in this sector, okay. Now, they couldn't just send out these things like they were because they're trying to keep, you know, this whole thing secret. So they would send it to this room where the message would be disguised. Things like um, Agent Manfred near your sector has reported uh, the probability of uh, action, you know, uh, within the next couple of days or something vague like that. Because they didn't want to give away, you know, if they gave too much information, they didn't disguise the message. The Germans would you know, figure out, hey, maybe they know our codes. So that's the next thing they did. Uh, they kept very meticulous records of uh, coded messages and everything that happened. And then uh, in this room, actually, this room, they uh, further uh, worked on the disguise. And then in this, this is, this is where they actually sent the messages out. Now, this thing staffed 24 seven. They're dealing with 1100 messages a day, starting in 1940 for six years. And I, I just, you know, what an effort, <laughs> what an effort. Uh, and and the, the significant talk about pressure, it's one thing to say, hey, you really need to crack this code as fast as you can. It's another to say, you got to figure this out, you know, pretty quick because lots are at stake. Okay. I thought this whole part of Lexington Park was just as interesting as the code breaking. Right? And it's not well advertised. All right. 
get near the end here. This is a Lorenz cipher machine. It was so heavy that the British nicknamed it Tunny. It had 12 wheels, uh, of which seven were used at a time. Uh, five of the wheels uh, served the same function as the three wheels on an, uh, on an Enigma machine, and then two of the other wheels cycled to further scramble the sequence of the other five wheels. And it was used by Hitler to communicate with his senior commanders and leaders. And so when they decided, when they uh, figured out this was being used and um, the, the, it overwhelmed the capability of the bomb machines. They had to have something bigger and better and faster to make this useful. So a British design engineer named Tommy Flowers built a machine called Colossus. And uh, it was first used in 1944. It used electronic circuitry and thermionic valves, which you and I know as vacuum tubes. And it used uh, originally, the original one used 1,700 vacuum tubes that eventually used 2,500 vacuum tubes. If you're thinking that sounds like a modern digital computer, it is, okay. Uh, they were actually able from uh, late in 1944 or sometime in 1944 to 1945 to read Hitler's personal messages. It'd be like, you know, read this encrypted email these days. I, 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 if that doesn't blow you away, I don't know what does. But anyway, um, for many, many years, the first electronic computer was considered to be NIAC, the NIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was built at the University of Pennsylvania uh, under contract to the U.S. military to calculate uh, artillery trajectories, and it was later used, later used to calculate ballistic missile trajectories. Uh, for many, many years, it was considered the first electronic computer because the existence of Colossus was kept secret. Uh, once Colossus uh, was revealed to have existed, this is this is the ultimate forefather of this. Is that machine right there? So what's the legacy of Blightsley Park? Well, when I first signed up for the tour, and I saw, oh, we stop at Blightsley Park. That sounds kind of cool. I saw the movie, Neat House, you know, and it might be interesting. <laughs> when I left, it was one of the highlights of the trip for me. First of all, what these people did, with all their intellect and all their energy and all their ability was to help save Britain from the U-boat threat, because they did break their naval code pretty early on, so they knew where U-boats were gathering, they could route convoys around. Across the course of the war, they saved hundreds of thousands of lives by knowing you know, what the Germans were up to. But here's the important one, a lot of experts feel like it shortened the war by two to four years. And yeah, the, the loss of life in World War II was staggering. It, it was millions a year of military and civilian people. And so, you know, pick a number. I mean, but clearly shortening the war saved many millions of lives. And uh, so we all owe a debt of gratitude for what these folks did here. And I thank you for having me back. So. Are there, are we have, are there any questions? Yeah. How long did it take them to break the code that it, they could get useful information in an operation? They didn't start from day one making the break code. There is a lead up time to when it was really effective. Well, it was. Uh, 
effective fairly quickly. Um, the, uh, they started working in earnest on it in 1939. So they actually developed it fairly quickly. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the art of taking the transcribed messages and translating them into, and it was an art, into actionable uh, information, that took longer. Okay. Yeah, that was what I was really driving at. Yeah, that took longer. And how, but, long, how long when was the gap from 39 to when did when that big machine, the bomb? That came on in, uh, in 1944, there's an about impact. a year before the end of the war. There's a creativity time lag in there. Of, they had to create all these tools to do the encryption or to decode things. Right, right, yes. Were they sharing the intelligence with the Russians? No, not as far as I know. I, I recall, yes, that the naval warfare was the, the best use of it. Why didn't it pick up anything about the German buildup for the Battle of the Bulge? Because if it had, that could have turned out a lot different for the Germans. Well, that's, uh, you know, the Battle of the Bulge was a great um, intelligence failure. And uh, the Germans were pretty good, were pretty secret about the buildup. Um, even though they thought their transmissions were safe, I think they, they kept it to a minimum. But quite frankly, because I've read a lot about the Battle of the Bulge, is a lot of it was just allied hubris. You know, they just, you know, okay, we're here, you know, we're going to be in Berlin pretty quick here. And, you know, anyway. Well, as it turns out, the Battle of the Bulge ended up a disaster for the Germans. Yes, it did. It, it was Hitler's and, and, last and throw the of the result, dice. Yeah. yeah. He would have been better off to save the resources, but that's not fighting a defensive war was not in his makeup. <laughs> yeah, he still <laughs> loses, but if he didn't do the Battle of the Bulge, might have extended a couple of months. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually reading a very interesting book. Uh, I don't know if you know who Victor Davis Hanson is. Um, he's uh, he's actually on uh, Fox News a lot. He's a, he's a member of the Hoover Institute and sort of a thinker of political things and all that. Really smart guy. He wrote a book about World War II, which isn't the history. It's about the major themes of the war. And, and one of his themes was that the, the Axis nations from the get-go, we're in denial about the uh, technology development capabilities of the Allies, and um, that uh, you know, that was one of many reasons, you know, for their downfall. Right. Yes. What happened to the Polish uh, mathematicians who? I think some of them escaped and, and ended up at uh, Bletchley. I'm not sure, um, but I, I know they, uh, you know, they got the information to the British. Did the Germans ever catch on? No. I thought there was an Enigma 2 code or something that came on. Well, they did. Yeah, you know, they eventually developed a machine with four wheels and, you know, there, you know, and there were some, there were some other little codes here and there. Um, which, you know, in the interest of time, I spared you, but uh, it's uh, this, that was their main machine and, and uh, they use it right to, like I said, nobody knew, the Russians didn't know, so. And really there weren't a lot of people in American military that knew when, uh, when they sent out these, uh, these messages to the commanders using the data, they called them ULTRA, U-L-T-R-A, capital letters. And you were told uh, everybody who was an officer knew if you got something that had ultra on it, don't ask about it, act on it. And uh, but they were very careful to you know all kinds of things. You know, the, the resistance tells us of some agents on so time. They made up names of agents and all kinds of stuff. Um, just to keep it secret that we were reading their mail. Anything else? Anybody online got any uh, questions there? All right. 
Well, thank you for all attending. Uh, I really enjoy doing this because obviously I have a passion for these topics. And uh, maybe you'll have me back sometime for something thank else. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was extremely informative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody on the Zoom session. Hope that was a better sound than last week. Well, next week is John Hurt. Next week is John Hurt. And he's going to be speaking on the Berlin Airlift in 1948. We'll become World War II experts pretty soon. <laughs> they are too bad. Yeah. yeah. The importance of great yeah. Yeah. one of the most important things that happens during the entire war. And keeping it a secret that we broke yeah. is critical. Otherwise, they change it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. In fact, one of the. Um, one of the interesting stories is uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the capture of the German submarine. Yes, five of five in the Russian I mean, I don't know a lot about it. Yes, I'm familiar. So, so this uh, commander of a hunter killer which yeah, right in my head task force just by the ground trying to find some Miami to keep right here. And down there, uh, and they had a little aircraft carrier and a bunch of destroyers. Anyway, that's the commander uh, on his own volition thought, you know, it'd be great if we could capture one of those things. Sometimes they serve as a bailout. So I actually trained a little assault team, inflatable boat, and all that. So they forced this thing to, to surface 